Good morning, Markham Chinese Baptist Church. It is good to be able to worship with you through the internet. Um, I know it's a little bit weird, but uh, for today's call to worship, I want to actually share a little bit about this worship experience um, over, you, uh, over YouTube Live. Uh, and I know it's a little bit weird um, to sing music to a screen, um, but the whole point of musical worship is a way for us Christians, if, in case you didn't know, uh, is a way for us Christians to connect what we know, what we believe about God, to how we feel about God. Because music has this weird way of connecting our head and our heart together, of bridging that gap. Um, and so even though singing to a screen can feel a little bit awkward, I encourage you to sing anyway, um, as a way for you to exercise that bridging uh, within yourself. And so let's sing these songs together uh, with the same amount of joy and the same amount of um, excitement towards God and the same amount of um, uh, reverence uh, towards God that we would have done if we were doing this in person. So let's sing. He's our rescuer, He's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore, and oh how sweet the sound of our grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive, good news for the saint. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. So oh, how sweet the sound, oh how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. And he is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor, and he is friendship for the one the world ignores. And he is pastor for the weary. Rest for those who strive, for the good Lord is the way, the truth, and life. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, and life. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. And oh, how sweet the sound. Abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. So come and be chainless. Come and be fearless. Come to the foot of Calvary. There is redemption for every affliction. Here at the foot of Calvary. So come and be chainless. Come and be fearless. Come to the foot of Calvary. Cause there is redemption for every affliction. You're at the foot of Calvary.
In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in help, this babe, this gift of love in righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the crown. His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he sat in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine. Oh, I'm born with the precious blood of Christ. Oh, 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 oh. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From my first cry to final breath. Oh, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more forever now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I own. My hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, I 
how strange and divine I can sing all is mine yet not I but through Christ in me The night is dark but I am not forsaken for by my side the Savior he will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I owe my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in me No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold. My sin has been defeated. Jesus, now and ever is my plea. All the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold my own. Is only Jesus all the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall be peace, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Let us have a time of prayer. Our prayer is found in the Book of Common Prayer. This is the third Sunday of Easter. It says something like this. O God, whose blessed Son did manifest himself to his disciples in the breaking of the bread, open, we pray thee, the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work. Through the same, uh, through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning that we can come to pray and remember uh, that you have risen and risen indeed, even though it is a third uh, week uh, since Easter, we know uh, that the hope and the promise of you and being with you one day forever uh, is still the living hope that we all want to long for and strive for. We thank you, Lord, that you forgive our sins. And we thank you, Lord, that you have died on the cross in order to be our payment, but that we are even greater uh, appreciating the fact that you are our Lord and our Savior and our King, and that you were the promised one from Old Testament, uh, from all the prophets, the book of Isaiah, uh, book of Ma uh, Malachi, uh, all pointed to you uh, coming to reign in Israel and therefore becoming uh, the King uh, over all creation. And so, Father, we just thank you for this wonderful gospel, Lord. Father, we also ask, Lord, that you will continue to help us to walk in your ways and to live for you and you alone. We thank you especially, Lord, uh, for uh, your provision uh, for each and every one of us. Though, Father, we know some of us may be out of work, uh, some of us uh, may feel lonely and feel uh, stuck at home, Lord. But Father, your grace is sufficient for us and your strength is made perfect in our weaknesses, Lord. So Father, help us to lean onto you, to lean into you so that we will know a joy that is beyond all understanding and a peace uh, and a comfort uh, knowing that no matter how things evolve uh, with COVID-19 or anything else, Lord, you are with us and you are for us, Lord. Father, we pray uh, for the continued uh, healing and continued restoration uh, from COVID-19, whether it is through uh, human means, uh, through the frontline workers, through our nurses, doctors, uh, through uh, paramedics, Lord. Uh, may they continue to be able to bring people uh, from uh, dire situations. And Father, we want to especially uh, pray for the long-term care uh, facilities that have uh, multiple outbreaks, Lord. We grieve for the elderly who cannot fend for themselves and also the uh, workers that have to work uh, tirelessly. We thank you that the army has been sent uh, to go into some of the more dire homes, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that the outbreaks uh, would, be, um, would be stopped uh, as soon as possible, Lord. We continue to pray uh, for um, all those uh, essential workers, especially those in the grocery stores, Lord, who work tirelessly to provide us with all the goods and gifts uh, and, and things uh, for us so that we can have some sense of normalcy, Lord. May you continue to watch over and protect each and every one of them, Lord. As a church, Lord, we continue to pray that we would be able to gather uh, as brothers and sisters through technology. We will be able to communicate with one another um, so that we can uh, seek uh, and receive prayer from one another, encouragement, uh, continue to read the scripture, watch videos that will edify and grow our faith, Lord. So Father, I just pray, Lord, that more brothers and sisters will uh, take this opportunity to come close to you and to uh, stay close to their brothers and sisters, to find small group and find community so that they would be able to grow in their faith, Lord. Father, we especially ask, Lord, uh, that we would uh, continue to pursue you, uh, even though right now um, our posture may be one of um, just uh, staying at home, Lord. But Father, help us to know ways that we can still be part of your kingdom. Lord. Lastly, we pray for the tithes and offerings, Lord. May you continue to use it to bless uh, your ministry, especially this online ministry that we are building in the hopes that not just those that are already in MCBC, but our friends and our neighbors would be able to hear the truth of the gospel and be able to accept and submit to your kingship and lordship uh, over our lives. May their sins uh, be forgiven and may they be restored as sons and daughters of yours. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to ask uh, brothers and sisters if you have prepared 
a tithes and offering, uh, you can go ahead and um, send, or if you've already done so, you can just uh, read the instructions, just a friendly reminder of how we do our tithes and offering uh, this morning. And I will be uh, back with you in just a moment for a short message um, from the book of Second Corinthians. Thanks again, Pastor Joanna, for giving us this wonderful message for our families and our children last week. We've been looking at 2 Corinthians since last summer, and we still have three more chapters to go, and now we're into chapter 10. One of the hardest experiences I find as a pastor is what I would call playing the pastor card. What I mean is that there are times where in ministry and in an organization where I really want to be seen as Mr. Nice Guy, um, especially when it comes to issues of character and morality and rules, though, I have to not sometimes be Mr. Nice Guy. Um, my record on this has, of course, not been exemplary. I tend to either go way too soft or I go way too hard on people. It's, it's just hard to find a balance. Uh, I figured that, you know, if I go hard, I pummel away at the person and then run away, then everything will be resolved and I don't have to deal with the aftermath. Uh, but in general, I don't like to say something which could make people think or like me less. And uh, yes, I admit that I'm sometimes a people pleaser. Uh, couldn't we just all get along or couldn't we let this go? I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure that person already kind of know that they're wrong. So why do I need to go there and make sure that they know that they're wrong and then correct them? I would think of all these reasons why I don't want to rock the boat. Now, that's just in my head. But there are other times where I am like, you know, the judge. I, I want to make sure that black is black and white is white and that whatever they have done, you know, they need to be responsible for. Um, to not let people get away with doing wrong. Um, I have to admit, uh, sometimes I can be very merciless with my words, especially with people on WhatsApp when I know that, you know, my quote unquote opponent or enemy is not reading and all of that. I just become very, very lax and I can say things that are really, really harsh. So there's a duplicity in me and it appears that in appearance, I want to be as nice as uh, possible in public, but in private, I have a strong sense of anger and justice and fairness. Maybe we can all relate to that. As long as we're in the wake of the fall, sinners as we are, we're all going to be duplicitous in one way or another. And getting the right balance of it is very, very hard. On the one hand, you could sometimes, you know, need uh, things to get done. And I'm not sure if you've been ever on the receiving end of this. Maybe this past week or maybe just a few weeks ago, You've been on the receiving end and they tell you, you know what, it's not your job performance, but you know, company's not making a lot of money. We need to temporarily or even permanently let you go because of COVID-19. Or it could be the other way around and you could be actually the one that's on the driver's seat having to deliver the news that, sorry, you know, the company, uh, it's not personal. The company would just like to Say you've been a valuable member, but we need to temporarily or permanently let you go uh, because of uh, COVID-19. And all the while in your mind, you're thinking about, you know, this person still have bills to pay, uh, kids and children and family to feed. And you just feel so miserable but having to do that decision. I mean, um, there's no beating around the bush uh, to say that you're too nice. Uh, if you're too nice, they don't get it. And if you're too harsh, you're adding fuel to the fire. So how do we properly exercise authority, especially our spiritual authority, uh, with those who did nothing wrong, all the, all the way to uh, people who have done something terribly wrong? A bit of a reminder where we've been and what we've learned so far in 2 Corinthians. We know that Paul used chapter 8 and chapter 9 to talk about this collection in Jerusalem, because that was the whole thing uh, about that the Jerusalem church was in need. They were in a famine and they needed help. But now Paul goes back to 
his discussion about his worthiness and his apostleship, whether he is, should be counted among one of the apostles. And uh, if you recall, Paul had actually planted the church of Corinth on his second missionary journey and was planning to visit, but because of a few setbacks and circumstances, he couldn't go back. And so him being not able to go back, coupled with one particular individual in 1 Corinthians 5, uh, who had a grievous sexual immorality against his uh, stepmother or with his stepmother. And then there were people who were siding with him and saying Paul was too harsh and all of that. It led to this really bitter feud, a rift between Paul and his church. And Paul wrote a strong letter to, letter to rebuke the church and it seemed to have worked. It was uh, delivered by Titus and it seemed to have worked. The Corinthians repented saying they want to restore their relationship with Paul. But not everything was fully uh, restored, as we will see. And now, um, the opponents of Paul uh, took advantage of this and started sowing seeds of mistrust and distrust uh, to further divide Paul and his church. So Paul will spend the remaining chapters defending himself to the Corinthians and his opponents. What can we learn from Paul's handling of situation as an apostle with authority from Jesus to care for his church. How authoritative should Paul be? Should he bear his whole heart with them? Um, where is this lingering distrust coming from? Should he abandon this church altogether? I mean, he still has Philippians, the Philippians, he had the Thessalonians, and everyone else. Maybe he doesn't need, you know, this heartache with the Corinthians. Um, Paul's answer to all of the above, though, could be summarized as this. And if there's anything you need to remember, it is this. Christ-like authority is God's gift to tear down distorted thoughts and build up believers. Christ-like authority is God's gift to tear down distorted thoughts and build up believers. And we're going to look at that in three sections. The first uh, part is spiritual authority is always Christ-like before boldness. Chapter uh, 10, verses 1 and 2 says, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. I beg you that when I am present, I may not have to show a boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect of us walking according to the flesh. Notice when Paul, uh, what Paul first says here and how personal he is. We remember most likely Paul uh, uses a scribe to write the letter for him. But when he says, I, Paul, myself entreat you, he wants the Corinthians to know in no uncertain terms that this is his wish, this is his desire, this is his plea, not the scribes or anyone else, not even his co-sender, which in chapter 1 we would know is uh, Timothy, though he probably, Timothy probably shares the same sentiment. Uh, he appeals to two characteristics of Christ that we also ought to appeal to when in terms of correcting someone. First is meekness. Someone who isn't easily angered, uh, can think beyond themselves, someone who uh, knows what's best for others and are not stuck to having their own ways uh, done. Um, of course, this spells out who Jesus is, isn't it? Jesus loved people of all walks, all cultures, and desires his disciples to do the same. And in uh, one verse in Matthew eleven twenty nine, he says, Take my yoke up on you, for I, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The same Jesus who welcomes children uh, to, to him when children are the most despised uh, next to woman in first century Palestine, uh, heals the most disfigured people, eats and welcomes the lowliest and the poorest sinners, washes his disciples' feet. This same Jesus shows that meekness. And the second uh, characteristic is gentleness, which has actually the meaning of leniency. It has that sense of being merciful, of not taking justice to the nth degree because it would be unbearable for the one who is being punished. It kind of reminds me of uh, a video, I don't know if you saw on uh, Facebook, 
uh, when it went viral, Judge Frank Caprio, who was uh, trying this man named Victor Corella, he's 96 years old, and he was caught speeding uh, next to a school zone uh, on the road in Providence, Rhode Island. When the judge tried to hear the reason of this 96-year-old man, why he was speeding, these, uh, this man gently said, you know what, I've never speed uh, uh, in my life. Uh, I, I, I try to obey the law as much as possible, but I had to drive my 63-year-old son to a cancer treatment. And when Judge French Caprio heard this, he had leniency, he had compassion, and he decided to be gentle on uh, Victor and even praised him for his love and his family and tossed out the case. See, I looked it up. It would have cost um, Victor Capella, Coella um, $95 if he uh, is over the speed limit. And then for every mile he's over, that's another $10 added. But he let him go. Jesus' gen general posture is forgiveness, isn't it? Who says, he's the one who says, neither will I condemn you. Go, therefore, and sin no more to the woman who was caught in adultery. And he gently corrects his disciples who wants to burn down uh, the towns that defy them and, and they all fight to become the first in the kingdom of God. Jesus fully displays this character of gentleness or leniency uh, in his character. And Paul wants to appeal using those two characteristics to the Corinthians. That's what he had tried to do all throughout the disagreement, even in the painful letter, because ultimately that painful letter led to repentance. The charge seems to be that Paul is duplicitous between his harsh letter and the nice guy image. Well, who's the real Paul? And so his opponents use this as an opportunity to maybe uh, accuse him of being double-minded, being uncertain, being flaky. You know, he's all words and no action. And therefore, hardly anyone worth respecting. But Paul ends on verse 1 in no uncertain terms with this. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. See, Paul isn't afraid to be bold again. But if a confrontation will lead to sorrow and bitterness and that all could be avoided, he rather always take the first stance to appeal to a peaceful uh, resolution because that is what Christ would do. In other words, the type of leadership the opponents are saying is absent in Paul precisely because Christ is present in Paul. This also gives us a framework to work uh, out of when it comes to our relationship as a church and an organization. At times, uh, we do have to have that hard conversation with this brother or sister or this colleague or this uh, friend about maybe an addiction that they have uh, or a gospel, gossip, gospel, gossiping tendency or someone always boasting about themselves and belittling others. Someone who refuses to cooperate and be a team player. Or correct just incorrect teachings they've been spreading within the small group or within the church. We must have the mind of Christ. We must have a heart larger than our fickle pride and our bruised ego. To not see the other person as an opponent, as an enemy, as someone to squash, as a nuisance, but as a dear fellow brother or sister in Christ, whose faith is now on shaky grounds, and you may be the one who needs to gently, but also persuasively, correct them in their wrong, with love and with grace. So that is the first point. Spiritual authority is always Christ-like, with boldness. Paul then goes into how to handle things delicately. That's why today's sermon title is Delicate Authority. You attack the thought, not the person. You attack the thought, not the person. Two, spiritual authority tears down sinful thoughts, not person. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 to 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh 
but the divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. It's clear Paul's opponents fight dirty and attack Paul both with his physical presence, his words, his actions, his meek and gentle demeanor, which they you know, attributed as weak or humble in the original uh, Greek understanding, someone who is you know, not m much of anything or anyone to look at. Um, in other words, his humanness. That's what walk in the flesh means. Whereas at the end of verse 2 and the middle of verse 3, according to the flesh, in the uh, opponent's way, it actually says he is living by the standards of the world. That is according to the flesh, which is a very archaic and, and, and it's very close to the original translation, but very hard for us 21st century people to understand what it means. Most likely it means living by the standard of the world, by human standard, uh, we're guided by or act from human motives, uh, dictated by human weakness. It can mean all those things in different uh, English Bible translations. In other words, Paul says despite being accused, there's some worldly motive uh, of, or signs of weakness behind his dealings with uh, the Corinthians uh, by his opponents, he's not going to fight back with the same cheap shots on, his, on the opponent's characters or on the uh, opponent's um, physical appearance. Uh, he will, however, fight back truth to truth, thought to thought. And, and, and this re reminds me uh, of uh, what he does next. He's going to use these warfare or siege metaphor. Uh, and, and then he's going to launch into a discussion on spiritual warfare. And a spiritual war warfare that's powered by God himself and not by human schemes or trickery. And, and just this reminds me of uh, that picture of the last battle you know, in uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, The Return of the King. Uh, when the armies of Gondor has assembled right at the gates of, of Mordor and the menacing tower with the eye of Sauron still looking to and fro, standing and representing all things that are evil, that are malice and that are treacherous and proud and undefeated. That's the image I have with all these strongholds that Paul was talking about. And they're tall and imposing. And they represent the demonic forces behind the arguments that are mounted against Paul and his brand of the gospel. And so uh, the word every lofty opinion, the word opinion actually is not in the original Greek. Every lofty things that are raised, it, it literally means the highest of heights raised. So it, it, it almost r reminds me of the Tower of Babel, of how human achievement, human arguments build this monstrosity of something that dares to defy and uh, oppose God. But all of that, all of that will be toppled and flattened because no matter how many arguments pile up against Paul, Paul has an intimate knowledge of God. He knows Christ. Later on, we're going to see that he even says he is in Christ. And when you have the truth of the gospel with the mind of Christ and Christ dwelling in you, all of these evil schemes, all these towering accusations, and all of these evil plans fall at the mercy of Jesus. See, Paul then uses another siege and war image, uh, saying that you, know, you have to take captive of every thought so that they would obey Christ. There, there's no place for lies. And like a prisoner of war, the untruths need to surrender and be captured and tried until they align with the truth of Christ. Through well-crafted counter-arguments, Paul will attempt to persuade one mind at a time to metanoia. And that word should, might be familiar with us if you remember from Romans 12, 1 to 2, uh, that idea of being transformed by the renewing of our mind, Romans 12, 1 to 2. Uh, to stop thinking from the world's ways to what would Jesus do from what would the world do to what would Jesus do and then to do it. That's where the obedience comes in. Um, the little part 
about punishing every disobedience uh, right at the end of verse 6 is a very interesting. It says the, uh, the uh, uh, punishing every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Uh, what does it mean? Who is doing the punishing? Is it another war metaphor? Well, it's actually Paul appealing to the Corinthians that when your mind has fully captured what the true gospel is, I don't even need to uh, oppose these opponents. You will do it on my behalf because you will stand for the truth. And you will stand for the truth. And then their disobedience will be punished by you, not me. And then your obedience will be complete. Just as it happened in 1 Corinthians with that sinful man, so now Paul is appealing to the same strategy, which is you can prove your obedience to Christ, the true gospel, and to myself by being the one who dismantles the lies of my own opponents. See, the war against untruth is one, one thought at a time. For us, that means as much as God's grace allows, our arguments and disagreements should never be personal. And if the person we want to correct takes it personally, we must have the mind of Christ, his meekness and gentleness first, and then persuade by pointing out the sinful thought and not attacking the person with name-calling and slanders. We have divine power at our disposal. We pray for the Spirit to work in their life to hear truth and not Satan's falsehood. We point them then to Scripture as to where their error is in the hopes that they will repent. They will metanoia. Their mind will be transformed from the carnal things, the worldly things, to thinking in the mind of Christ. So, first, we need to have the characters of, of Christ, and that should be the first thing before we boldly uh, uh, argue and attack. And then the second thing, of course, here is we always are looking at the thought and not the person. We are attacking the thought, not the person. Finally, spiritual authority is given by God for building us up. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ. Let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Paul points to the source of his authority, which is from the Lord. In fact, verse 7 is Paul's way of defending himself as being in Christ because the Corinthian church is Christ. He happens to be the founder of the Corinthian church. So how can he not be in Christ, but the Corinthians are in Christ? And how much more the opponents are in Christ? It doesn't make sense. That is the way he makes the argument that you have to take captive every thought of Christ because if my thoughts, in fact, the gospel that I preach to you, Corinthians, came from Christ, then I must be in Christ. And if I must be in Christ, so you also must be in Christ. Now weigh the two and see if you are indeed in Christ. Remember in 1 Corinthians, there was even a ridiculous dispute in the young church as to who follows Paul. Uh, because some are following Apollo, some are following Peter, some are following uh, Paul himself, but all of them should ultimately follow Christ. So by extension, we also are Christ's, and we have authority to help others in their Christian journey. Similar to the first point, ultimately, even Paul's strongest rebuke are not meant to completely demoralize those in the wrong. But so that when there are no more excuses, no more lies, no more misguided and misleading thinking, when everything is flattened, remember that tower metaphor, from the new foundation of Christ, the church can be built up again with the right center, the right foundation, the right cornerstone, 
the right center, Jesus Christ. So not only do we not take it personally, we also aren't primarily a demolition crew, but a construction crew that restores gently and carefully those who would repent from their sin. That's why Paul earlier on asked the same church to restore the sinful brother uh, in chapter 7. Um, two letters to the same place, the same church, show the full process of tearing down and building up. Tear down happened in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Expelled immoral brother. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 builds that person up. Now that you should restore them in case that they would fall into excessive sorrow. So this also reminds us that it is a journey. At times a painful journey of longing and waiting and even being disappointed again. Sometimes there will be people in our life who will need to and they will even themselves choose to disobey God and will require multiple demolitions of their lives, of their soul before Christ before they will turn back to the cornerstone of their life. And building up a broken soul takes a long, long time with a lot of setbacks, a lot of backsliding. But if we have the meekness and gentleness of Christ, whose closest disciples even deserted him in his greatest time of need, we can rest assured our Christ-like meekness and gentleness will not be in vain. So in closing, here are a few reflection questions for us to think about. One, who is, it, who is it in your life you have been hesitating to walk alongside of because you have already branded them in, in their mind as a lost cause? Might God's truth today help you to give it another shot, to call them up, to FaceTime message them and see how they're doing? Secondly, what conversation have you been avoiding to have because you are not sure how it will turn out or how you will look in front of that person? And finally, who have you been harsh in your words or actions thinking it's for their own good lately when Christ is impressing on your heart? Build them up. The time of demolition is over. Now is the time of construction and build them as your brother or sister. Let's have a moment to just think about these three questions that are now on the screen. Father God, we just thank you for this time of this apt reminder that you have a heart of meekness and gentleness and this is how you want our posture in life to be. Even if and when we carry spiritual authority, even when something is wrong or that we have been wrong, Lord, you do not want us to be like the lords uh, of, of the pagan world. Uh, to try to um, overpower uh, and, and pummel and crush our enemies, Lord. But Father, you want us to attack the truth that is uh, misguided, the truth that is ultimately falsehood. And then once those ideas, those excuses are torn down, you want us to rebuild the person. So Father, help us to know who it is that we need to have this talk with and give us the courage to obey you by having that conversation and see the fruit that may take some time, that may take a long, long time of seeing this brother or sister, this colleague, this friend, this family member be restored in Christ. Let's thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me what is your life amidst that vanishes at dawn? All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ, His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ, His will be done, His King come on earth as is above who is himself our daily bread praise him the lord of love then living water satisfy the thirsty wind Without price, we'll take a cup of kindness, yet all glory be to Christ. And all glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ. sing all glory be to Christ when on the day the great I am the faithful and the true the Lamb who was for sin Good morning. My name is Alex Wong. I'm one of the deacons at MCBC. Welcome again 
to our English morning worship. Right after the worship, we have a time for chit chat. It's just a time we get to know each other better and catch up. And right after chit chat, around 11.15, we will start our Sunday schools. We have two of them. Please join us in one of them. And next, are you currently in a small group? If you are not, you're more than welcome to join one of them. You can sign up at mcbc.com slash small dash groups. And now here are the announcements. In this difficult time, different hospitals have different needs. We would like to encourage our brothers and sisters to make an, a donation to their local hospital. And if you are going to donate to Markham Stillview Hospital, we do have a team there. It's called Markham Chinese Baptist Church Beat COVID-19. Please join us and make a donation. And also at these difficult times, we understand that brothers and sisters may have special caring needs and in our prayer items. Please do feel free to contact any of our pastors in their respective divisions. We will do our best to render as much assistance and support as we can. And while we worship together at a distance, we can continue our obligation of offering via either e-transfer or mail-in checks. Details are on our bulletin. And lastly, it's about VBC 2020. We will try to run this program this year from August 10th to 21st. BBC is open to all children who are currently in grade JK, sorry, currently in JK to grade six. Registration is on now and open to all. Please go to www.mcbc.com. All details of the announcements is on our bulletin. Please go to mcbc.com slash bulletin for more de details. Thank you.